Oh yeah, you, so, you sound great. great. You look roll, like you're, you're in the matrix awesome. there. Awesome, awesome. So we'll get the uh, logistical stuff out of the way. Post-pandemic winners and losers is the topic that awesome graphic Travis Wright made in the back. If they're doing a the LinkedIn thing, I'm still getting the uh, hand signals down. Small guys up there throughout, big ones over there, or you can just Google the name. Happy to connect or answer any questions because I'm going to fly through this as best I can. Maybe there'll be some time for some questions at the end. Joel and Travis would always love those because you usually take it to another level. So um, I believe in transparency as it relates to bias. I, I never like uh, when I have to try and guess where someone's bias is. So I'm going to disclose mine. There's two groups of it. I'll call it the foundational bias. Anyone who's ever listened to me kind of uh, knows what some of those are. And then the supplemental bias. These are, these are books that I'm going to duck out of the way for a second here so you can get a screenshot. That uh, was your chance. Um, uh, but look those up. Uh, we'll, we'll talk through a couple of them. Um, but these, these things will come up throughout the talk and, and I disclose them so that you understand that although I don't know if I'm right, I hope I'm not right about a lot of this stuff. I think I am. Um, and uh, that's not to be alarmist because I don't believe there's any value in being alarmist. But I do think that um, we can all be smart. And a lot of these themes will be recurring and, and I've listened to several of the talks this week. And so um, I think when you compile them all together, you guys have done a great job and hopefully this will help draw some insights out of it for you. But let's start with what we're up against. Uh, you saw the book, The Watchman's Rattle in there. It came out in 2011. Um, I produced a show back then in 2012 that G. Edward Griffin was on during Occupy Wall Street with Rebecca Costa. But the thing that she always told me that stood out, and she's a dear friend that um, is one of the smartest people I know, is that we've got Paleolithic emotions. We live within medieval institutions and amongst godlike technology. And why that matters is that another book that complements the evolutionary biological constraints that Rebecca goes in depth on is Neil Howe and William Strauss's book from 97 that's called The Fourth Turning. Many of you probably read it or heard people talk about it in nauseam, so I'm not the only one. Um, but it really changed a lot of things for me in 08 when I first discovered it uh, and began reading it a couple different times. And when you look at Edelman's trust um, uh, barometer as of 2017 when Travis and I wrote Digital Sense, um, trust was already in crisis according to this global Edelman trust barometer. And, Fourth Turning kind of prophesied that um, based on looking at these generational cycles. And so the problem is when you take uh, this trust being in crisis mode and, and living within the fourth turning, which is called the crisis period, uh, which is somewhere between now and 2025, maybe 2028, based on his most recent uh, assumptions that, I, that I've caught up with, um, coming to a pinnacle. The last time we came through that was 1945. And so when you have trust in crisis, you have all these things that we've been talking about for years now, like we need new systems, we need new currency, we need, oh, blockchain, Bitcoin, like all these great ideas, but they don't really get anywhere, right? They, they get to scale and the early adopters make money and we've got Bitcoin billionaires already and we've got Bitcoin millionaires. But the reality is, is that we're weird. Most of the people in the world still don't know how to buy it. It's still super hard to get. And they don't know if it's a scam or not. They think it might be rat poison because Warren Buffett believes so. Um, and, and so we're nowhere even near uh, where, it, where it matters. And yet we know that it does matter, right? Um, but this war of wealth that Travis, you did a great job talking about with the history of money. This has been going on for thousands of years. It's gonna to continue to go on. And this is independent of central banks because prior to this third central bank, which both G. Edward and Travis covered in depth called the Federal Reserve being formed 107 years ago, we had the national banking era. And we had bubbles during that, as you can see on this slide. And so it's not exclusive to central banks that we have these booms and busts, but what is exclusive to the current situation is the amount of velocity we've put into that curve. And our population has followed it. So as you look at the chart here, the, the, the national banking era and the, and, and the central banking era, the second national bank prior to that, leading up to this current one, which began in 1913. Um, and these stats are through 2010, but again, uh, this, we all know we're 2020, right? So we have 7.8 billion people trying to make the turn this macro cycle, this fourth turning, the last time we came around the corner in a crisis, there was 1.7 billion people. So we're, we're literally almost six and a half, seven X the amount of people. And the other big difference that you've probably already intuitively figured out is when we had 1.7 billion people going through this kind of change, they weren't all connected. And most of them lived in rural parts of the world. Less than 5% of them lived inside of a city. Today, 
as we make this next turn through 2030, over 65% of the 7.8 billion people on this earth live inside a city densely packed together. And we're all connected, obviously, or we wouldn't be having this soon. So that brings different dynamics into the mix. And so these are some of the things that just as a level setting context prior to COVID that we're dealing with. These are the, these are the environments that we're playing in. And Gerd Leonhardt is a friend, and we had him out in Fort Collins years ago when we produced an event there, um, has said this, I think, in 2014 or 2015. One of the books on that earlier side was Technology vs. Humanity. talks about these mega shifts. And this is his quote. But the way that I always articulate it is, you and I are this couple, right? We are George and Martha's cousins. And we went to bed last night with bare skin rugs over us to keep warm, um, candlelight to read by, and when we blew that out, we woke up and we had running water, we had electricity, we had, uh, even though it's not operating, we had a city bus, we had rail, we had Wi-Fi, we had drones overhead, we had cameras on every corner, we had an iPhone waking us up. Imagine how you would feel if you went to bed under a bearskin rug and you were blowing out a candle and then you woke up in that reality. You would feel like you weren't part of this world. And so if you can imagine how they would feel, then take everything that you're comfortable with right now, as you listen to this, you were able to log on to a Zoom and watch an international conference for the last couple of days or for the last 10 minutes. You're comfortable with that, but that will feel like blowing out a candle in 2040. And that'll stretch your brain a little bit. So if you wonder what happens to us, right? Our evolutionary biology, what happens to our brains when we start to try and compute that exponential math? Well, we revert to habit. And so we start to do the things that Rebecca talked about in Watchman's Rattle, which is we, we correlate irrationally. Um, we get gridlock, we get polarized, right? We become ideological. Um, we replace fact with belief, right? Because we just can't compute all this stuff. And so it's easy to find and then lean on crutches. And so we revert to habit and we become polarized and we become all the things that we've seen emerge over the last 15 years. And culture has best been described to me as nothing but more than group habit. Think about it. It's always the other person who has the accent, isn't it? It's never me. So culture defined as group habit is nothing more than if this is a picture of our mind behind us to help you organize how your mind works. You have the conscious mind, which is your thoughts, the ones you choose, the ones you neglect, the ones you reject, the ones you accept. They create the feeling, the thing that ultimately operates inside you as a vibration. And then that moves you into action, the things you do or don't do, the actions you take or don't take. Emerson called it the law of laws, cause and effect. It doesn't happen when I do something, the effect out there because I did it, it happens at the thinking level. So culture is this movement of group habit at scale on the thoughts, feelings, and actions, and then bam, here comes an uninvited guest. We could have predicted, I agree with the side of this that says it wasn't a black swan because it wasn't. Oil going to negative 38 bucks a barrel, that was a black swan. No one saw that coming. COVID, we knew it was coming. There's movies about it that all of us have been watching in Netflix as early as 2007 and 2012 and 2015 and then the show, 2015, right, 2017. They've been predicting this forever. Um, it's just never gonna happen to us, right? It's never gonna happen on our watch. And so these unprecedented firsts, think about this. Not only do we have 7.8 billion people making the turn this time through this crisis period of the fourth turn, which is 6 point something billion more than the last time, but we've had for the first time in the history of recorded humanity, 10,000 years-ish, net zero migration for the last 60 days. The first time in the world, nobody's moved anywhere. Think about what the implications of that might be on the backs of all your habits being broken, all of your abilities to move around freely for a small period of time, not by law, but just by choice even. Some places it's by law. But even if it's just by self-quarantining, think about what you're gonna do, what choices, what aha moments people have had in their house? Do they like where they live? Do they like the city? Do they want to be out in the rural area because they can connect and work remotely? What's going to happen to migration out of hot spots, as Parag Khan calls them, once people can start moving again? Where will talent flows go? What will that mean for business? 
what will a global work from home environment that has been forced upon us? It broke the habit of remote work was a nice thing to have and offer like massages and cereal at Google. It went from a nice to have little ding on the we're culturally friendly box to a everyone does it. So guess what? Deal with it. Teachers have had to learn how to reteach stuff. Everyone's had to learn how to work from home. So now it's not so scary anymore. The habit was forced broken by this uninvited guest. 1.4 billion kids are now homeschooling, not because they chose to, but because they wanted to. We've been thinking about it for years. Now we don't have to think about it. We did it, we're comfortable with it. I think a big percentage of people are never going back. What's that going to mean? Who knows, right? But these are the opportunities. So there's winners and losers in this. Millions are out of work in jobs that'll probably never come back. Negative interest rates are around the world. Our Fed is at 0.6 basis or 60 basis points or whatever, near zero, going to stay there, according to Jerome Powell the other day. The bottom line is, as you'll see in a second, I'm of the camp that believes that if we don't go negative, um, we'll wreck the whole deal faster. Um, so I'm not in the hyperinflation camp. I'm actually in the strong dollar kills everything camp. But we'll talk about that in a second. So here's our friend Satoshi. He gives us hope. And that hope has now become a belief. Because... I think at this point, we've hit a religious moment amongst toddlers, amongst newbies, and amongst and a massive generation of 80 million that aren't going back to a world that doesn't exist with crypto. And Bitcoin is the only one without an ego attached. And so whether it's perfect or not, I'm of the opinion that it is here to stay because it can never be created again, ever. $200 billion worth of infrastructure and growing. Volunteerism at scale, it's a true thing security, unlike any other asset class that's ever existed in the history of human earth today, right now, even at 8,800 or whatever trading out today. Thank God I hit over 9K yesterday. A little bit of excitement back in the juices. Eric Coffer tells us that we live in a time where learners will inherit the earth and the learned will find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. And you know people that are beautifully equipped and are gonna get smacked in the face in a bad, scary way because they don't understand what's happening. So what do I watch? Real vision. I watch other things, but here's who I follow on Twitter, mostly. I follow a lot of people, but here's who I read and have been dialoguing with the most. You can screenshot that as well. Because half a billion people are gonna be forced into poverty globally, according to this chart from Statista. Half a billion, sorry. And that's a problem. And that's a problem that can be solved because as they're going into poverty, the people that currently aren't listed in poverty are so layered up in consumer debt and so broke and so gonna be out of a job and so upside down on the pricing of, of everything and what they need versus what they actually want. And that consumption that is driven 70% of US's GDP was mostly baby boomers for the last 40 years, picked up by the you know, Gen, Gen X's and Gen Y's behind that, but it is not gonna sustain at that level. And we're only 340 million people strong over here anyway. So we can't prop up a world of 8 billion people with consumption because A, we're too broke to do it. And B, we're not enough of us. So unlocking that other 3 billion is going to be key. And we've been talking about that for years. But again, habits get broken when they're forced and they get replaced when they're forced, not when it's a good idea. So these unprecedented job losses are just beginning. 26 million, probably going to 30 million by the end of this week when the new report comes in. But here's the fact that, that took me for alarm. If you look at the, you can't really read that, but I circled it so I can explain to you. In, in 08, we saw a 58% drop in the market and we had a 0.8, negative 8.4 quarter over quarter growth. So the recession, the GDP from Q, the same quarter, the prior year of 07, was down 8.4%. We dropped 58%. The quarter over quarter growth, first quarter of this year, was negative 25% in change. So almost three and a half X, three X, 08. And we've only dropped 34%. And we're still ripping it, you know, near all time high. So as Charlie was just talking about, none of it's rational, none of it's sustainable, and none of it makes sense. And you have this polarization going on as we look at whether globalization is the key or nationalism is the answer. And what I'm going to, you know, jump in the camp of here is that we, we live in this world where, as Parag talks about, we're, we're con constantly moving towards what's called max entropy, right? The devolution is a perpetual fragmentation of territory because of connectivity, because of globalization, where the units become smaller and smaller. States becomes, you know, municipalities, becomes counties, becomes towns, right? And 
And so people reside inside of mega cities or mega corporations, and these things can be, you know, multi-state, multinational. And um, this is a map, actually. This is called Future Map. But this is a map. There's a Harvard one, and there's also another one out of another school that works with him. And what they've done is they've mapped out how the world's connected. So he wrote a book called Connectography several years ago, follow up to that called The Future of is Asian. But connectography is really the anchor that, that lets you understand the infrastructure that's in place. So whether we're ideological about globalism is good or bad or nationalism is right or populism is right, whether we want to keep America great or keep the world great isn't the point. The infrastructure is global. Borders are less and less meaningful today than ever before because the friction that they create could kill an economy overnight. We learned that with supply chain just trying to get N95 masks and other things out of China. So as we think about how we reinvent the supply chain so that we're more sustainable, we have to think about enlightened nationalism because populism is playing into the meme, the super meme that causes all collapses according to Rebecca Costa, which is the polarization and the ideological war. What we have to understand is our infrastructure is globalized, but if we can have enlightened nationalism, we can rebuild economies that are more sustainable. I truly believe, and I Googled Suez crisis the other day because I wanted a graphic and I found out Washington Post had just done an article about seven days ago on this. The Suez Canal, essentially, if you understood what, what was the uh, bluff that, that broke the British Empire in a matter of four years, they went, they literally lost 24% of their, or 24 of their territories by 1960 after the Suez Canal crisis. And it was essentially when we called the bluff and said, we're not going to back you. Um, and, and so we became the, the next empire at that point. And I think America's at that point, not that we're going away, not that we're not relevant, but that point where this American empire, we've wondered about, will it ever crumble? Will, what will that look like? What will our role be? Will the dollar hegemony cease to exist? Will Bitcoin go to zero? All these different questions that are ideological. The reality is I think we've had this Suez crisis and um, who knows what that new power is gonna be. We know what the Cold War is. We're in, we've been in a Cold War for quite some time, Cold War 2.0 with the CCP and with um, mainland China. And it's been this frenemies kind of situation that again, I'm not gonna get in the political debate of it because there's too many camps in that. But I, I'm gonna predict now, and I, I don't know or really care whether I'm right. It's more just so that you guys are understanding how I'm organizing this data in my own head and I'm interested in the debate or the commentary. China announced this week their, their BSN network, right? Their blockchain network. You got Tencent, Baidu, all these major players in it. I believe the Sputnik moment, which is basically when the space race began, not the Cold War, the Cold War had already started, the space race began between Russia and America was when Sputnik went up in space because they were the first ones to get up there. We were the first to land on the moon, but the space race began then. The blockchain race has already begun, but I think our aha moment here, because we haven't woken up yet, will be 11, 11, 20, which is in a few short months. And the reason why I say that is I called this about six months ago before all this went down. I see no reason why if I'm China, I don't shock the world by having the single largest consumer holiday on the planet occur in my own crypto, on my own blockchain rails, with my own e-com, and without a cash transaction in the mix. And if you want to participate or purchase something at Singles Day, whether you're American or not, we don't care. But last year, they did $40 billion in a single day in sales in retail. And um, they control their own currency. And if they have a blockchain and they have the retail component of Alibaba and Amp Financial, and they already have the interface with WhatsApp and the integration to pay stuff without ever pulling out a cash or card or any of that, how couldn't they pull this off in 11, 11, 20? And what will that do to send shockwaves through the rest of the world that is trying to figure out if there's ever gonna be an economy to go back to? So here comes Miley with her dollar wrecking ball. And the dollar wrecking ball, again, if you want real insight onto this, um, you know, you, you want to follow Rao Powell and some of the other guys I listed there, and, and we're almost near the end here, so I'm going to speed this up. But essentially, I think it looks something like this. We're going to have some kind of bounce. We're already seeing a little bit of it in 2021, 22. We're going to have some kind of massive insolvency that happens between 2022 and 24, and it's going to hit a really bad, earth-shattering, fourth-turning crisis scenario somewhere in 25 to 27, and then we'll start to come out of it. Um, the, the recovery analysis that McKinsey did, again, I'll, I'll turn left and turn right. As you'll see, none of these, according to McKinsey, on how the recovery would go when we reopen things is a V. And yet all you hear about on the mainstream media is a V-shaped recovery. It ain't going to happen. Um, for the first time in history, though, there's things that we're already doing that we're going to have to figure out how to do. We're going to have to build. America's been great because we're the most entrepreneurial state in the, in the history of humanity to this point. 
we've, America was built, not assembled. And we have to get back to that. And other countries are following that too. So it's not specifically American centric thing, but it's something we can do. And Gartner says that right now, that companies are literally manufacturing customers because the machines are already there. So Trillions, which was one of the books that Mickey McManus wrote with a couple other people, talks about the role of how there's trillions of IoT, inter, inter, uh, net of things devices that are connected to each other, learning from each other, learning from us. And for the first time in human history, we're not now dealing just with a physical environment of cells and atoms and everything else, but also a virtual one that is living in our physical space that is bits arbitrage with atoms in real time. And we can turn those bits into customers. And so companies are going to manufacture machines to buy the stuff. And they already are. Here's some use cases, and then we'll go to the end. So this was the chart between 51 and 2019, long before COVID. Doesn't look good to be in the automaking business because people don't buy as many cars as they used to. Okay, you want more data. This was before people were out of work at 26 million going to 30 million. There was 22 year highs on a 90 day delinquency rate of subprime auto loans in 2018. That number's only gone up, it's only going higher. So this begs the question, if in 1920, Henry Ford with the Model T and with the, and that was able to democratize auto ownership, but now what we care about is access, who in 2020? Where's the winner in 2020 that's gonna create affordable, flexible access? Well, I'm gonna make a bold prediction. I have no skin in this, I don't own Tesla. I'm not gonna get in a religious debate over whether it's a scam or whether it's the most amazing company ever. What I'm going to tell you is that the only company that could go into a model rapidly where they could create mobility as a service and they could literally provide Model 3s, the Cybertruck and whatever through subscription plans that other companies with traditional dealer networks have tried to roll out, but it only works in cities. But imagine if you're paying 150 to 200 bucks a month and you have a Tesla membership and you don't have to pay auto insurance because it's covered. You can cancel at any time. You have a small down payment, maybe it's 500 to 1,000 bucks to get in. And then you can basically freeze it like a gym membership or whatever. So if you're like me or Travis or Joel, when the economies are opening, you're traveling a bunch, you don't need a car sitting in your garage three months out of the year doing nothing. And you don't want a 500, 600, 900, 1,000 dollar payment, or you're too broke to afford one. Would you like a Model 3 to pull up to your driveway? Get in when you need it, pay 200 bucks a month, cancel it, freeze it when you can't afford it. $100 billion company with 10 million subscribers tomorrow. So I'm bullish Tesla for that reason. And by the way, over the air updates, the only network, it's not about EV versus gas. It's about, can I update this thing? Can I feed back data in real time to the insurance companies? Can I feed back to the municipalities and create revenue streams that never existed before because I can tell them where the potholes are because the car is doing it, not the human. So 76 million jobs in the travel industry gone. Who knows when they're coming back? What's that gonna do? That's gonna shut down ports for a while, maybe long-term and all the businesses around it. New York's here, not just because of the current crisis, but because in the, um, when, when the depression happened, the Empire State Building was built, it took 20 years before it was cash flow positive. So as wonderful as that building is, and as iconic as that building is, the person who built that building waited 20 years before they broke even, right? And if you haven't followed uh, commercial mortgage-backed delinquencies, one of the biggest shorts happening right now is Icon short of CMBS, and it's working. And the COVID virus just took it up. It was already on the, on the rise prior to COVID in March of 2019. And so I don't have the data today, but I think you can figure it out. Esports, sports in general, how are we going to connect with teams? How are we going to reinvent sports? FCFL competed in our Sandcastle Challenge years ago. This is a game where it's like Tecmo Bowl meets real live avatars. You're seeing the data that says people want to engage with stuff. 25 year olds in 1980 had Dow at 972, had 15% savings rates. Sure, the mortgages were just as high, but the houses were affordable because of it. The jobs actually paid a living wage. And they had nothing but upside in the yield curve. So they saw a trajectory where everyone who says, well, you can't lose money in bonds for the last 40 years. Yeah, it's because when they started, there was the, they were at the bottom. Bonds today, negative. So you're literally gonna pay to have risk-free capital. That's the, only, that's the only thing bonds are good for right now. Right, the market all time highs we've already talked about. So what's the only thing a 25 year old can get excited about today? Crypto, whether they're in a shit coin or, or, or the best coin on planet, the fact is it's the only thing that's got upside. And it's got a lot of upside. So I don't see 88 million people going back to something else, but here's the four kinds of money as we wind down that people are gonna have to deal with. We've always had nature's money. Some call it God's money, gold, silver. That's been around forever, right? It's the only thing that's still current. It's the only safe haven uh, as of today, where money will fly uncorrelated to market, right? But unfortunately, 80% of it's controlled by the central banks and owned by the central banks, specifically the G7. So you and I can access it, we can buy a little of it, we can't buy enough to get a seat at the table. 
So then Satoshi comes along and creates this whole industry with the white paper. And we have, for the first time, we have a people's money, which we all know about. We know what that is. Can't be shut down. Can't be subpoenaed. Democratized access. But it's not big enough. A trillion dollar pension fund manager is not buying Bitcoin today, even though, you know, went up 40% yesterday or whatever. Why? Because a 40% gain on a couple billion dollars exposure doesn't lift the needle on a weighted average return on a trillion dollar asset. A quote the other day I read was at $55,000 when it hits parity with gold's market cap, we'll start watching it. And at 350, we'd like to probably own some. Think about that if you're hodling anywhere north of or south of where it is today. A pension fund manager is telling you at 350, we'll probably start to buy some. This is either zero or millions, but it doesn't have adoption and it won't get to the adoption that we want, no matter how much we pontificate about it, which is why corporate money, which is the fourth wheel that never existed before, the, the feds, the government never had to deal with this variable either. So they got to deal with the people's money they can't shut down. Then they got to deal with the user money that, that is scary as hell because Libra comes out and says, I got two and a half billion people ready to go. WhatsApp's already taken people's money. And so you can imagine as a government person right now what you're thinking. But here's some theories that are reviving. And I'm actually, this is going to piss some people off. But I think if you think about it for a while, you'll, you'll find the possibilities of it. Again, again, not about idealism, about pragmatism. If you want freedom, Bitcoin is, is the closest thing to your answer and then the privacy coins that will come to that. If you want a hedge against the next 20 years, I can't think of a better one because it's literally binary, millions per coin or zero. And it ain't going to zero as far as I'm concerned. But that's my opinion. What gold will do is maybe go to five, maybe go to seven, maybe go to 10 current. So that's a good store of value, but it isn't going to have the disproportionate return that the asset class of Bitcoin will and some of its top you know, contenders. But Silvio Gisell in the 30s came up with free money, Libra Moneta. And it wasn't about giving it away for free. What it was about was liberating it from the need to be a store of value. He didn't believe store of value money and a, and a medium of exchange should exist in partnership because it implied you should hoard it. And you can see that today. The biggest problem the Fed faces or any central bank is what's called the liquidity trap. They flood the money with new dollars and people hoard them. So they don't get to where they're supposed to go. And then they have no way to track them. So hey, Chris, I feel like you've got so much information that you could unload all night long. I got um, one slide left. We, we got to move along, man. Where can people get the slides? I'm going to put them up on YouTube for you. So here's, here's the last thing. We'll, we'll put up an extended uh, version of this and we'll record it. We'll put it on YouTube. I don't want to get into Pomp's way. If you want to follow me, uh, just follow me there. And I'd love to have you join the wait list for Wild Hackathon in September. We'll see you there. Um, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. And uh, awesome to be here. That's great, man. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. There's a lot there, too. That was like three presentations in one. He crammed yeah. a lot in there, brother. That's fantastic.